see a lot of young people in the audience. I mean, who is this guy up front talking to you? Well, as I was introduced, my name is Terry Matthews. I'm from Canada, the capital of Ottawa. And in 1972, I started a company up called Mitel. Now, some of you will learn a little bit, I think, from my story. It goes a bit like this. I used to be the head of applications for a company called Microsystems International. Now, Microsystems International made integrated circuits, and I was head of applications. So in this role, I would go around the world, talk to clients about how to use the chips. That was my job, how to use those integrated circuits. I first came to Singapore in 1969, and here's the interesting thing. There were no high-rises then. Look at it today. So it was good for me traveling around the world. I came to Singapore, I went to Hong Kong, I visited most of the US cities, a lot of the European cities, always interacting with clients. And in 1972, I set up a little umbrella company called Wesley Clover, which was named after the fact that I used to go to the Wesley Church when I was little, and when I was little playing with my friends, I picked up a four-leaf clover. And so I called it, because a four-leaf clover is lucky, so I called it Wesley Clover. God knows why I did it through a, an umbrella company, but I started up Mitel. And that company was started with only $3,500. Now this is something that I think everyone would be interested in is how do you start up a successful tech company? How do you make a tech company really successful when you don't have enough money to pay anyone? Now at first, being a very young individual, perhaps I'd made a mistake, maybe many people can't do this, but I borrowed $3,500, and because I couldn't pay anyone, I took in some brand new graduates. Now I want you to think about this. New grads, are they typically married? Do they have children? No, they don't. But I didn't have money to pay them. So I gave them ownership. They had ownership in the company. Now, this for me is almost rule number one. When people have ownership, the chemistry is totally different. This is not, I worked, I got paid. It's netted out. I worked again, I got paid, it's netted out. If someone down the road offers more money, they're probably gone. But ownership's different. Ownership creates passion and other things. So we worked incredibly hard for six months on the first product. And the first product, what do they work on? This is another little part of the chemistry that I developed in 1972. And it's not complicated if you think about it. This is not the beginning where you say, I have a great idea for a startup. I'm going to take that great idea and I'm going to develop something and then try to sell it. I, I don't do that. I speak to potential customers and I listen to what they want and then I build what they say they want, and surprise, 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 they actually buy it, because that's what they said they wanted. It's not a surprise at all. You generate a very good relationship with that potential client becoming a client. Not only that, they become an advocate for the next customer. You talk to the next client and say, why don't you talk to this customer? And of course, they help to develop the product by explaining what they wanted. The advocacy is excellent. It's always better in life if somebody says you're good rather than you say, I'm good. Much, much more powerful. So lesson number one is ownership drives much more power, much more hard work ethic. So in my case, it was seven days a week, almost around the clock, developing what clients said they wanted. And the other thing, if you think about that, it's not speculative anymore. It's actually what customers said they wanted. And you're pretty much guaranteed of the sale. 
So ownership, listen to customers, it becomes customer pull, not customer push. So this is all about relationships, developing relationships with the team, developing relationships with the client base, and it minimizes time to market. Then I discovered another thing, and it really was a discovery because I didn't do it before. Every quarter, I wrote a report. Now you might say, well, why do that with a startup? Well, it's very important. It actually logs the history of what the company's doing. And by the way, remember those people that came in and only got paid with ownership? They want to know what's going on. So I found in my career that the cadence of every quarter is enough. Not every day, not every week. You take everyone and talk about the report that you just wrote. And here's another little lesson I found. Take out the hype. Do not put hype in the first page. That really turns people off. Because very often, those reports come into the hand of people who's not technical. They are just not technical. So the worst thing you can do is to begin a report with saying something as an example, you put in an acronym. We're really pleased we develop an IPVP. What the hell is IPVP? And it could be that the people that invest in the company are not technical at all. They may be quite bright, but they don't necessarily understand the acronym. You totally turn them off. So those quarterly reports, I honed them right down for simplicity. And interesting is that the first investor in the company was not technical at all. It was an aunt. Here's Auntie Barbara, whose uncle George died and left the money to Auntie Barbara. And she says, well, uh, I get these reports. I know what's going on. I'll invest. Well, guess what? That early company called Mitel, 10 years later, every dollar turned into two and a half million. Nobody complained about not being paid. They all became millionaires. What a hell of a thing to learn when you have no money or almost none, and you listen to customers. That drives the product. You put quarterly reports together. Now think about those quarterly reports again. A year goes by. Actually, it was a year and a half went by. And investors are interested in the company and you say, well, he here's the last four quarterly reports. And remember, it's written in a manner which is not hyped. There's no words like awesome. At most, you say, I'm pleased to report. Make those reports part of being professional. Write it in a manner which is simple to understand so that your grandmother can understand what's going on. What customers are you dealing with? What was sales? What was sales previous quarter? So everybody becomes on side. And new investors, you say, well, here's the last four quarterly reports. Now they know about the history and what's gone on. But there's another very important part of the message. Here's a potential investor, and they know there's another report coming next quarter, and the quarter after. This is about the most simple set of rules that you could possibly think about. But it's fundamental to success. Hard work ethic for the team. Good interpersonal skills with the team members. These are very important things. Quarterly reports. Those quarterly reports go to friends and family of the, of the employees or the team. And it spreads. They get to know what's going on. They feel good. I'm pleased to report sales last quarter were clunk, clunk, clunk. Here's the worst thing you can do. You wouldn't believe last quarter. It was awesome. We just couldn't have expected such a high sales level. That says you had no control. You didn't know what was going on. That's actually a terrible way of doing things. Much better to say you pleased. Much better to say as expected. Now it's more controlled, it's not hyped, it has no acronyms, it simply tells what's going on. 
So this was a little formula that worked very well for me. And guess what? The investors loved what they did. The team loved what they did because they know what's going on. Even to the level, here's an example for you, even to the level of someone that's a cleaner, they read the report, it's in simple English, they can understand it, but you never know what the cleaner has in the way of relationships. Just because somebody's cleaning toilets doesn't mean to say they're stupid, doesn't mean to say that they don't have really good relationships, doesn't mean to say that they can't be persuasive. It's all about building teams. It's all about building teams with the clients, all about building teams with the investors, with friends and relatives, and transparency. I found another thing. You're only as good as the, as the people that you work with, the people that you associate with. So very quickly, two years into my tell, we began to put a board of directors together. This was another incredible learning. I happened to know the person who ran Deloitte's in the town. And I asked that person who'd recently retired if that person would be chair of the audit committee. I mean, this is a little tech company, two years old. And somebody who used to be at Deloitte's Think about somebody that's worked in accounting all their life. Now they're sitting at home, they've been retired for two years, they planted some tomato plants in the garden, they repaved the driveway, they rebuilt a back wall, they re-insulated the roof, now they are really fed up. They're sitting at home twiddling thumbs. Now this is a no joke part of the story. Imagine if you're an investor you get the four quarterly reports or six quarterly reports that tells about the progress. No hype, no acronyms to de detract. And you say, yeah, we, you know, we have a board of directors and uh, George Jones, wasn't he the general partner for Deloitte's? Yeah, that's the guy, he retired two years ago. You see, it says that the financials must be accurate. A person like that cannot lie about the financials. You just raised credibility. You just raised the profile of the company. You just showed transparency. You just showed that the financial results, whatever they are, are properly run. So suddenly an investor feels good. An investor feels that it's properly run, transparent. The team's working hard, look at the progress. These are simple, simple rules, no hype. And guess what? It works. Now, I've done this many times in my career. I continue to do it because there's a great pleasure in taking young people and watching them become business people. In any society, it's really good if you take young people, new grads, well-educated in college or university, you work with them and teach them about business. This is not somebody who's a super duper computer science grad, although sometimes they are. You see, there's much more to business than there is about just the tech. The worst thing in life is to have 40 million lines of code, and what was sales last quarter? Well, we didn't have any sales, but we have 40 million lines of code. That's clunko, total clunko. How do you turn the technology into a commercial affair with sales growth, profits, success, partnerships, distribution? How do you do that? Now, in my career, the first exercise was Mitel. It grew very fast. First year, $1.3 million. Second year, 5.8. Third year, 11.2. Fourth year, 22.1 then 44, then 120. The company went public in the US and Canada in 1978. I became pretty wealthy at that time. And because I never sold any shares, I can explain to you that every dollar turned into two and a half million. It became 40 million shares after all the transactions, about 40 million shares at 58 US a share. So now you have kind of a number. I did a similar thing 
Uh, well, let, let, well, let's go to a very high level of abstraction. Newbridge grew to be $10.7 uh, $10 billion. My tool grew to be $2.6 billion. And then another company out of Vancouver became $1.3 billion. In my career, I've started up about 150 tech companies, no bankruptcies. Some companies have failed for a variety of reasons, but no bankruptcies. I have never been sued. Part of it is because of the transparency. Part of it is because of the oversight with boards of directors. Part of it is because ownership with the team. And a big part of it is human relations. Go back to that very high level of abstraction again. Many people in this room will be from the tech sector. Think software. Think brain power. Now this is an important little consideration and it's very high level. This is not about investing a billion dollars in a plant before you can get a first dollar of sales. That's not what it's about. It's about brain power. How do you get people to work together well? How do you get people to work together as a team, drive hard? Now, I don't find this very hard to understand, and it might have led to the success that I've had in my career. Just think of simple things. Here's a hand. There's a hand. Here's another hand. Is it a competitor, or does it work together? Ever tried to read a book with one hand? That's very, very hard. Try reading a book with two hands, and the other hand will turn the pages and make it easy for you. You see, very often, if you think about it, a very high-level view, one plus one might be a hell of a lot more than two. Ever try to run with one leg? If they're working together, you'd be surprised how well they work together. It's about relationships and how you work. It's about, as an example, if I could take you back, let's say, to the 1990s, and this would be a team of people, let's say, from the Newbridge Company. I would transparently talk in the quarterly review about what goes on. And it doesn't matter how sensitive the questions are, you have to engage with the team. Now, I've developed a sensitivity like a brick. You can ask anything you like, and if I'm able to respond, well, I would respond. But go back to that high-level view again. How do you get somebody to do and work what they want to do instead of being told what to do? The worst thing in life is to tell and point. You do this. Now you really, you didn't develop a very good relationship. Imagine a situation where somebody is in a team meeting and you deliberately, as the leader, pick on somebody. You did a terrible job last quarter. I can't believe that you would do that. What a stupid thing to do. What have you just done? You've humiliated that person in that team and that relationship is just killed. That person now will hate the team leader. Much better if you've got an issue that you talk about it outside the team. Do not humiliate. That is a terrible human emotion. And recognition is a huge one. John, I'd like you to come forward. That was great last quarter that you pulled that sail in. That was really something in the quarter. And here is a prize for you. Recognition. That is right up there, much more than a salary. Recognition, no humiliation. The team, I use the term mutual respect. If you can develop a team spirit with mutual respect, where you don't have to overlook everybody on the team, you trust them. Trust is a huge part. So the last thing I do is when I shake hands, I shake down. The last thing I do when I'm talking is to point at people. The last thing I do is to humiliate. That is the most, that most ugly thing to do. And finally, just a little word of caution for those that don't get it. This is not about being a Michael Jackson 
or a Donald Trump. It's about brand. It's not about you personally, although as a leader you have to do a very good job, you have to work hard, you have to create the way leadership should work with mutual respect with the team. It's about the brand. You can't believe how often I ask people, who is the chief exec at IBM? They don't know, but they know IBM. You see, the truth of the matter is, if you raise your own profile very high, you get plagued to death. You can't go out and have dinner with your wife or your husband. You can't go out on a bike ride without somebody bothering you. Play up the brand. Don't play up yourself. Little companies tend to say, I'm, I'm John Jones, founder and CEO, and my email is john at big tech. How many Johns in big tech? You just gave away that there's only one. The issue is about generating business. It's not about playing yourself up. Take a low profile. Be a little humble. It's about gaining sales with the client. It's not about placing yourself right at the top. If people within the team want you to be the leader, that is very powerful. Rather than you say, I'm the leader and you'll do as you're told. I found that doesn't work. Mutual respect in the team. I've probably talked enough about relationships. I've probably talked enough about the fact that in my career I've started up many successful companies. I've never had a bankruptcy, never been sued. There's probably a big message in that. And what I do in Singapore, having been here since 1969, coming back and forth, it's time now for me to invest some money and my time in building tech companies here. We have a fund called Alacrity. Alacrity is an English word that means move fast. I honed that process down and that funding down in Victoria, British Columbia, nice city for those that don't know, in Ottawa, in Cardiff in the UK, in Istanbul, Turkey, and in Lille, France. And now I'm here to do a similar thing in Singapore. For those that are interested in high-tech growth, for those people that want to join me as an investor, I welcome business people. This works by having business people invest as I do. It works with the business people helping the companies to be successful and getting the gains out of it. It works really, really well. That's why I'm here to continue to expand it. And there's another little part of it. Remember Mitel? I'm still the chairman of Mitel. It's a pretty big company, number one business solutions provider in, uh, in Europe, number two in the US. The dealer channels, the end companies that they supply, 60 million clients is a very big number. Into the cloud, big time. But those dealers, the dealer channels, the systems integrators, the companies into every type of business you can think of, hospitals, hotels, law firms, like clunk, 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 clunk. And so what's available is, is Mitel and the other companies I'm involved in, which are about 70 companies, partnering and helping to get global. Half the battle in life for a tech company, maybe more than half. Where's the channels to market? Who are the customers? How are you servicing the customers? These are incredibly important. It's not just the 40 million lines of code. Now, I, I think uh, we, we're going to go through a little fireside chat. No fireside tonight, but can, can we ask you to come up, Manishev? And it's great to see you, by the way. That's right, ladies and gentlemen. Please give a big round of applause for our moderator for this session, journalist from CNN, Ms. Manisha Tang. Oh. Please. <laughs> Hi, everyone. Um, so look, Sateri, it's my job to kind of fill in the blanks here. Now, you talked a lot about the relationships and your experiences and the things you've learned and what works. But one of the things I didn't hear you talk about so much was um, a bit of your background before all of this started. So one of my first questions was around, well, it's sort of, is it true that? And I had read somewhere that when you were very young, you were known locally in your town as someone who could fix things. <laughs> so if somebody brought you some broken radio or a broken vacuum cleaner, you could turn it into something that was actually useful. 
if this is true in general, actually, is this not at the core of some, some of the most successful businesses that we have in the world today? This idea that actually we service the need, the human needs. Isn't that most important? Now, this is a hell of a good question. And I was little. And I'll just give you one example of human relations and how it comes back in unexpected ways. I was brought up in a little town. I loved engineering. It was kind of in the blood. And I loved reading about radios, mechanical and electrical things and so on. And uh, for whatever reason in the house we had it was a garage full of tools. So I just had such enjoyment out of what you would call engineering. And the neighbors knew that I enjoyed engineering. So here's a lady whose husband had died, and she had a musical box. Now the musical box was kind of special because you could wind it up, and I've never seen one like it since. This is a Swiss, Swiss made musical box. And it would play a tune, so you get these little, little uh, spikes coming around playing a tune. After it played the tune, it would go click, and it would move down, play another tune. And then click, play another tune. But the spring broke. So you could keep turning it, but it, it sure as hell would never wind up. So I took this musical box apart, right down to the middle, and the spring had broken. I riveted it and flattened the rivet, put it all back together. I mean, for me, this was like, I didn't even think about the problem as being big. And I took it to the lady, and she cried. And she said, Terry, you know, I, 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 this is a big thing for me, and uh, how much do I owe you? And I said, well, like, I, I don't want payment, but I enjoyed fixing it. Well, I'd like to pay you. No, no, I don't need payment. Now, here is an unbelievable thing. She never forgot a birthday. She never forgot a Christmas present. If I was to talk now about that relationship, it became very strong. And all I did was fix the musical box, and I didn't ask for payment. Now, there's a big learning in this. You know, over time, I got much more out of that relationship than simple payment for doing a job. The goodwill, the word goodwill is often just not understood. You know, something can be looked at at a balance sheet and you say, well, okay, what's the company worth? Now that would be financially what it's worth, but there's another thing, what do the shares sell for? Of course, the difference financially is goodwill. So brands are important. I never screw with brands, like you come up with a brand, put lots of time thinking about the brand. You never change it. Year after year, that brand becomes powerful if you do a good job. So, it, but it is back to relationships. And so that simple, simple little lesson about the relationship with the lady and the, and the musical box, you yeah. see, she never forgot that. It's relationships in life are everything. They are indeed. And speaking of that, um, some of you out there might not, you've probably heard of Mitel, but does Mitel really stand for Mike and Terry's lawn mowers? Is that true? <laughs> it is true, actually. Mike, there's a good story here. Oh, no, I mean, this is very funny. I mean, it didn't take very long. Uh, Mike thought there was a great opportunity for silent lawn mowers in North America because there were lots of street houses being built and they all had little lawns and the lawn mowers at the time wah, 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 made a lot of noise. So Sears, huge retailer in North America, the purchasing person thought it was a great idea to have silent lawn mowers. So Webb's lawn mowers out of Birmingham in the UK made these silent lawn mowers. So I used very little of my money to buy the first six lawn mowers, but I wasn't smart enough to insure it or whatever. And CP shipping lost the container. Now at first they thought the, the container had been washed overboard. I didn't have it insured. 
Now, here's the bad thing about Canada. Winter's pretty bad in Canada in terms of snow and ice and so on. So here's the thing. We thought we'd lost the lawnmowers. They arrived at the end of October. Now, I talk to Sears, and they say, well, can it do snow blowing? I don't know, but it's, it's a lawnmower. So I went around knocking doors, trying to sell these lawnmowers. Nobody wanted a lawnmower, silent or whatever. You cannot give away lawnmowers in October, November in Canada. So I learned a very, very important lesson in life. Timing is almost everything. Otherwise, I might have been here as king of lawnmowers today. But the truth is, you cannot sell lawnmowers in the winter. And I don't know whether they net you the billions that it oh, has. Oh, God. But also, is the lesson there that, you know, you... Um, we then go into history and Mitel is created. Mm -hmm. And you ended up being in telecommunications, delivering mm -hmm. something that customers wanted that no one had had before, responding yeah. again to needs. So it's yeah. about listening to clients and listening. Yeah. Um, so here we are full circle. You've launched and built more than 150 companies or so. Um, you know, some young engineer comes to you with a great idea, mm -hmm. and him and his friends, or her and her friends. What is it you're looking for in these entrepreneurs? What is it you're looking for, for in these guys before you get involved with these companies, before you put backing mm -hmm. and money behind them? Well, team. How does the team work? You know, it, success is based on number one is the team. Number two, still the team. Number three, still the team. It's about the team. If things are not quite right with the client, then you so-called pivot and work with something until it's right, but client-driven. So this is all about client pull, not client push. And uh, so attitude of the leader is very important. I, I spoke a little bit about mutual respect. Don't humiliate somebody, otherwise they get totally turned off. How much better in life that somebody works hard because they want to, not because you told them to? In fact, I go out of my way not to tell, I ask. And that precipitates a conversation that I might not know why the answer was no to something. Why is it no? Now you have an opportunity to tell me. So how does that team work? Now, some of the little teams I work with, like in Istanbul, I'll give you an example. We've been there for three years now, two years with the Alacrity Fund. So there are two young companies there. One of them works four days a week around the clock. They don't go home. They just work and work and work because hard work ethic is at least one of the success items. The other thing is the leader listened and so the team really fights hard as a team. The growth is staggering, absolutely unbelievable because of the team the way they work together. Remember the story of the hand, and here's another hand. Are they competitors, or do they work together? If they work together, one and one is definitely better than two. Now you imagine, we're in the brain power industry. How do you get most output from one and one is two? Is because they have to work together. Very important. There have been failures. Yeah. Sometimes that happens. What have been the greatest points of learning that you've got out of those experiences? Because we can learn from failure. It doesn't have to be all bad. Yeah. Well, I, I mean, I'll give you one example. A great lady happened to be a software uh, designer, like absolutely fabulous, great team leader. But unfortunately, people at that young age, they might have a boyfriend that drags them out to Seattle from where the other team members are. And the team leader was incredibly, like, really good. But we could not do it Seattle to Ottawa where that team was. Now, so in, in my career, there's been reasons, like standards change. You might have pr provided, uh, let's say, a year's worth of development, and that, like, all that developed, the standards changed. Oh, well, I mean, what a total downer for the team. They were ahead of the curve, but the standards changed. It's another reason. Or, uh, you know, some, somebody comes up. Here's, here's a typical one. You work on a particular product line that was driven by client demand. You begin to sell it. 
but some other company says, well, but we, we've got the same thing and we're giving that away. Now it's very hard to get sales and profits when revenues are zero. Like that's, that's a whole new ball game. So you can get a side swipe that just was not visible to you. It can happen. It does happen. And uh, in, in my case, I do my very best to stay up with the industry and see beyond it. I always remember a very interesting, when I was quite young, working for the semiconductor company. So I go to a place called Halifax, Nova Scotia, and I'm in the chief engineer's office, and I'd like you to envisage this sign. Here's a sign, and it says, so it's, it's only so long, it says, think a head. You see, they couldn't put a head in, so you had to write up the side think ahead. So in my career, I've always tried to think ahead. Don't get caught. I do it with buildings. I do it with companies that attack. So if I put a building up, I think a little bit and say, what, what, if, this, what if this is successful? What do you do next? Did you think about it ahead? So you see this, this long bar in the hotel, if the hotel's successful, that becomes a corridor to an extension. Think ahead. If it's successful, now what are you going to do? If you hemmed yourself in, it's not going to work. You just grow so far, now you've stopped. So think ahead. Just a little rule that I have in my mind all the time, whether it's a building, whether it's a company, think ahead. I'm curious to know, when you look at the landscape today for entrepreneurs mm -hmm. uh, and for building businesses, and you see how much information is available and how our media, our connection with the media right. has changed, and you look at yourself, if you were doing that now, if you had done whatever you were trying to do then, 30 years down the line, would it be quite the same? Mm -hmm. That's a good question. I wouldn't blow my head out. <laughs> I wouldn't do that. But you do need to keep up with the things going on with the cloud and the framework, which pretty much started with a company called VMware. They really started up cloud. Now, of course, cloud is kind of processing and facilities way off customer premise equipment. And without a network, you can't get to cloud. So the the, the base items for cloud is power and network. If you don't have network, you can't get to it. So one of the things is, are you into the cloud? It's moving very, very rapidly away from things on site to cloud. Now framework today, like VMware started it, might tell had a big part to play in that because uh, cloud-oriented framework of 15 years ago was only non-real time. So, uh, as an example, some data apps would be off-site. What Mitel did was work with VMware and partner to make real time possible, which took quite a lot of change to the framework. Now you can do voice communications, video collaboration. You say, well, just a minute, that's through the cloud. But the framework had to be changed. That was a Mitel, uh, it's, instigated by Mitel Innovation, by the way. Um, but so, so today, please be aware of what's going on in cloud. Please be aware of what's going on towards 5G. You know, the move from 2G to 3G with mobile devices was about a 10 to 1 increase in throughput of the data. Then 3G to 4G was about a tripling. But 4G to 5G, this is a whole different ball game. This is small cell. This is about a thousand times the throughput of 4G. So like many people, they just don't get it today. This is a thousand times the throughput. And network cars, not just network people, network internet of things, so-called internet of things. So the world of tech is really quite explosive. It affects everybody. It affects everybody in businesses. It affects things that move and don't move. 
So networking and cloud is upon us. Virtualization of the apps, virtualization of the functionality. I mean, the, it's, it's hard enough to stay up, yet alone think ahead. Sure. But that's what I do. <laughs> how much time do you do? Like, how do you absorb all of this information? Is it something you're doing oh, no, come on, look on at a the daily bags. basis? Just <laughs> look at the bags. <laughs> I'm not seeing any bags. But, um, you know, is this just your daily exposure, talking to all of these guys that you're working with, right. just the input from that? Yeah, it's, it's, it's about the team. Remember the team? It's still the same with me today. How does the team respond? How does the team communicate? I don't run a company anymore because I'm currently into about 70 tech companies. I advise them. I have a team of people that work with me. And again, like how does the team work? Incredibly important that the team works well. And having been in business for a long, long time, I never develop quick overnight relationships. I'm not the sort of person that says, hey, great to see you, you're a great person. Thank you for the purchase order, gone. I don't do that. I have friends in Singapore that are still friends from 69, 1969. Well, as you see, I, I think long term. My relationships typically are long term, not quick short term. I don't do that. And so people I work with, they trust me, I trust them, we work together. It matters. In particular, when things change rapidly, that trust word is very important. And how do you communicate? Remember those quarterly reports? That tells you what's going on. And so it's those simple rules that work for me. OK, speaking of the simple rules, we have had some questions in on Pigeonhole. So this mm -hmm. is this platform. Um, I'm going to select one. I don't know if it's going to come up here, but I'm going to read it out anyway. So some very insightful views about treating staff with respect, and this is one of those rules that we talked about. What is one piece of advice that you would have for startup founders who are very new to the world of employee management? Well, first of all, the management, remember, ownership changes the chemistry and the way you deal. Remember the words mutual respect? I don't talk down to you. I don't shake your hands like Donald Trump. I don't push you out of the way. You have an ability to see and do things that I can't do in 24 hours. So if we have a good relationship, whether the news is good or bad, if I'm the team leader, we need to have trust, we need to communicate. So ownership, either through direct shares or through stock options, and then every time you provide stock options or shares, what did you put in that letter to the employee? Like here is an, an incredibly important thing, is recognition. So here's some standard letter. I want to thank you for working hard in the company and helping us succeed. Here's 1,000 shares in the company, or here's 10,000 stock options in the company. Now you're probably dealing with somebody that does not understand finance, does not even understand ownership but you try to help them understand. So I want to thank you for working hard and helping our company being successful. The board of directors has authorized me. Oh, now it's a level above. This is no longer my decision. Now it's a board of, the board of directors has authorized me to provide you with shares or stock options in our company. This is 10,000 options in our company. And by working hard as a team, we expect to get really excellent success in the future, and the value of these shares will go up in value. Just want to thank you again for working with us. Signed off, Chief Exec. Now, it doesn't stop there. Then you write in ink. You write on the bottom. I just want to say thank you for pulling in that order last quarter. You can't believe what that meant for the company. Now that letter, that letter will go on some special place and will never be forgotten because you got recognized, not from some standard form. So the regular recognition, 
whether it's in an all staff meeting or whether it's in a stock option grant, ownership is a very powerful motivator. Team leadership, it doesn't go away. Here's a mistake that many, many young companies make. They think everything can be done through WhatsApp, everything can be done through text. Sorry, relationship building is face to face. Relationship building is taking the time to make that call. Voice and better still face to face, boom, now you have a strong relationship. Not just simple text. Now I know you can do a lot online whether it's a, like a link connection to something that somebody reads, got it. Like you still have to do that. But there's nothing like that face-to-face -face building a relationship. That helps in the long term. So true. Everything is being so depersonalized at the moment. I completely agree. We're going to be out of time soon. Okay. But something I did want to speak to you about, very pertinent to you being here in Singapore, is here in Singapore, MAS is very keen to learn from you because the model has been so successful. Uh, people who've, we have a lovely audience and those who will walk out of here today after this fireside and after your address, what's the big message you want them to take away about, I mean, it's a big question, just summing up all of this learning of yours in your career. I, I would say don't think local try and remember different cultures, different countries, different languages. Do everything you can to be not just local, go global. And not only that, go global fast. Learn how to partner. Learn how to work, if it's a tech company in Singapore, learn how to work in the UK. Learn how to work in the US and Canada and so on. Go global and don't be afraid of partnering. Partnerships, how do partnerships work? Remember the one hand and the other hand? They look awfully similar, but they're not competitors. Not if you do it right. Thank you very much. And thank you all too.